GMA is a 107-year-old trade association. We represent food, beverage, and consumer products manufacturers. We are here today to talk about feeding 9 billion people. And so we have to ask the question at the outset, is that a problem? And my answer would be, only if you want to eat. We have a growing population, we need more resources, and authorities predict higher costs in the future. In addition to these issues, we lose 3,000 acres of productive farmland to development every day in this country, as I'm sure you all know. The number of people at risk of hunger in the developing world will grow from 881 million in 2005 to more than a billion people by 2050. So obviously genetic modification of crops is a, a hotly debated topic these days. And the question, can biotechnology help with these problems of meeting food needs, I think is easily answered that it already is doing that. The biggest impact, obviously, is in yields. You know, GM crops, because they're not competing with weeds for nutrients and water and sunlight, have an increased yield. But there are other benefits, as you can see, and in addition, we now have the first biotech drought-tolerant maize, which after being first planted in 2013, increased more than five-fold in 2014. I'm sure that's welcome news for some farmers in California. We are able to grow more with less land, and this total area requirement of 37 million additional acres that would have been needed to provide the same yield is equal to 9% of the arable land in the U.S. Worldwide in 2014, 18 million farmers planted a record 447 million acres of biotech crops in 28 countries. Of the 28 countries which planted biotech crops in 2014, 20 were developing countries. So this is a worldwide issue, not just centric to the U.S. More than half the world's population, 60%, or 4 billion people, live in the 28 countries planting biotech crops. So why is there any controversy? This seems like a great thing. And first, you have to address the issue of safety, because that's the automatic first concern when you're talking about food and such an emotional issue as how we feed our population. And the answer to it, whether it's safe has been a resounding yes. And there really should be no controversy, as this is a very widely held consensus at this point. There have literally been decades of study into the issue of the safety of food produced from genetically modified crops. You'll note on this slide and a few of the others after this that I'm referencing the declaration of Dr. Alan McEwen. And FYI, Dr. McEwen is a molecular geneticist employed at UC Riverside and provided expert testimony in litigation between the industry and the state of Vermont on their biotech labeling. And his testimony puts a lot of this information into one place where you can easily digest it and get the whole history of crop biotechnology and the history of regulation of it and how it's been tested over the years. So there's been literally decades of testing, as I mentioned. And what we found is that the, the, the conversation about the safety of GM crops tends to gravitate towards perfection. Is there 100% you know, safety that can be demonstrated? And as scientists would tell you, there's no such thing. And the real barometer is, is it any different from its conventional counterparts? I had about 10 more slides just with the quotes from the many bodies that have looked at this from either the US or internationally and weighed in with their views on this question of safety. And I pared it down to just three or four because I think you get the idea. The authorities that have credibility on this issue have spoken out and said, there's no difference between GM crops and their conventional counterparts. And I think this one is especially relevant in this section about claims about feeding GM crops to animals causing all kinds of problems. And if you spend any time on social media, you will see constant references to alleged animal studies and the problems that have been found. And they just don't come, they just don't clear any sort of rigorous scientific scrutiny.
The AMA has actually given their position that not only are these products safe, but that there's no justification for having special labeling. And I'll have a lot more to say about labeling in the next few slides. The World Health Organization, no effects on human health. The European Commission, these literally go on and on and on. But this one may be my favorite, the Girl Scouts. This should be a settled issue at this point, right? So again, why are we even talking about it? Where does this concern about safety come from? And if you ask the editorial board of the Washington Post, they'll say it's activists overstating risk based on fear and a distrust of corporations. And I think that's a lot of the same you know, sentiment that John was sharing on other issues. There are literally organizations that have been formed for no other purpose than to put out scientific so sounding findings on GM crops and try to build this notion that there is something to fear and some sort of legitimate concern out there. There's the famous Seralini rat study that I'm sure you've seen pictures of the rats with tumors. And not only was this study thoroughly debunked, so much so that it was retracted from this original publisher and expunged from their database as if it had never existed, but it was then published again. And the same criticisms still were relevant. And this was not a new study. This was just a republishing of the same study. And it, again, did not hold up to any sort of scientific scrutiny. So maybe there's another reason why we're having these concerns about GM crops, because there's no legitimate concern for safety. So I wanted to just back up and put a little bit of info in about what they are. More importantly, what they're not. And we've all seen pictures of tomatoes with syringes in them. You know, genetic modification isn't adding chemicals to food. It is a process at the level of growing the plant. And it is very widely adopted at this point in the US with 93% of corn, 94% of soybeans, and 96% of cotton in 2014 coming from GM varieties. A common myth about GM crops is that they're not regulated by the federal government. And in fact, crops, animals, food, labeling, all are very heavily regulated. You could fill a library with the statutes and regulations that govern them. At the end of the day, you essentially have four agencies that have oversight that they share. These agencies coordinate and sequence review at every stage so that by the time a genetically engineered product is ready for commercialization, it has undergone substantial review and testing during the research phase. And information regarding its safety is available. FDA's specific policy with respect to food is that the regulatory status of a food, irrespective of the methods by which it is developed, is dependent on the objective characteristics of the food. To date, over 100 GM crops varieties have been reviewed by FDA, and in every case, the nutritional and other composition of food derived from GM plants has been the same as that of the same food derived from non-GM plants of the same species. And I'd like to point out the great deal of time and expense that companies go through to make it through this regulatory process and have deregulated status, meaning that they can commercially grow these varieties. $100 million, and you know, the frequent criticism from activists is these technology developers are doing their own testing, as if there's any other way that it could possibly be done. The goalposts would simply be shifted if we expected the FDA and the taxpayer to foot that bill instead. So just to set the foundation more about what we're talking about here, the first GM product was insulin, and GM insulin is cheaper and more effective than the alternatives, which are derived from hogs and cattle, and therefore obviously spares the animals. Today, almost all insulin-dependent diabetics are injecting GM insulin. Chymosin is a GM variety of renin, the milk clotting agent used in cheese making, and most cheese today is used with genetically modified chymosin. Papaya, you may have heard about this story that one of the earliest uses of the GM technology was to save the Hawaiian papaya, which was, which was being devastated by the ring spot virus, which has no treatment, no cure. And they had to genetically modify a strain that was resistant naturally to the ring spot virus. So, you know, we've talked about how necessary these crop modifications are, how safe they are, well-researched, well-regulated. So the fun part of the presentation is the response to the question, why not label them anyway? 
Because we certainly get asked that question very frequently at GMA. And I found this picture on the internet, which I love because especially note the warning that the Amber Crombie and Fitch may contain clothing and the fountain contains water. This is really one of the most fundamental objections that we have to this GM labeling is that it's pointing out the obvious in most cases. In addition, it doesn't tell you anything. And that's really the biggest flaw in the labeling requirements that we've seen in the States. It won't tell you which ingredient is genetically modified. Anything with cheese in it could have a GM label because of the chymosin. And that doesn't tell you anything about crops at all. Even if you did have an ingredient label specific enough to say that it was a GM corn variety, for example, it doesn't tell you what trait. So if your concern is glyphosate, you would have to label all the way down to the level of saying this is herbicide resistant corn that was used in this product to give any sort of meaningful information. And at the end of the day, for food manufacturers, the molecules for GMO sugar or conventional sugar or organic sugar look exactly the same. There's no difference. This is also why we frequently get asked by activists, if GMO, modif if GMO ingredients are so great, why not proudly label and say the product has been improved with genetic technology? And the answer to that is, that would be as misleading as a label that says something about containing GM ingredients that's meant to be a warning. Whether it's meant to say something good about it or meant to be a warning, in either case, if the ingredients are identical, you, you couldn't say this product is better because it has GM sugar. The crop might have been better. The actual plant may have had all kinds of benefits for the farmer. It may have made the ingredient cheaper. But your food is the same. And that's why we can't brag about having a GM ingredient in food. That would be getting you in trouble with FDA. When you, when you actually have oils, starches, sugars in your products, they don't contain any genetic information anyway. So this is one of our concerns with labeling requirements that include sugar, starches, and oils, because they're conveying the information that there's genetic modification in these ingredients. There's actually no genetic information in the ingredients at all, and yet under every labeling proposal that we've seen in the States, these products would have to be labeled as genetically modified. So I'm sure you've heard increased costs with genetic modification, with, with mandatory labeling of GM ingredients. And you know, that's not because printing the label adds that much new cost. Obviously changing the labels does add a cost. But this research looked at what it would take for manufacturers to try to replace some of their ingredients with non-GM versions so that they wouldn't have to change their labels. And those ingredients cost more. And that's one source of the increased costs. Obviously, you know, when you have different labeling requirements in different states, it is literally no way that food manufacturers can comply with that no matter how hard they try. Right now, there are 20 states that have labeling legislation that was introduced or carried over into the 2015 session. And they have different definitions. They require different wording. There's no uniformity to the way these bills are being written. They have everything under the sun exempted that you can think of. They always exempt restaurants and alcohol. They deal with cheese in different ways. So even cheese, it's not clear how you'd have to label it from one state to the next. In Vermont, they just carve out all dairy, period. In some of the uh, ballot initiatives, they, tr they would carve out enzymes or um, processing aids to get rid of having to label for chymosin. Some of them take the approach that they will carve out meat and dairy from animals fed GM grains so that you don't have to label cheese under that rationale. The starches, sugars, and oils, as I said, that have no genetic material always are included and have to be labeled. What about insulin? Most insulin is, is genetically modified. Vaccines have genetically modified ingredients. Cotton. The vast majority of cotton is genetically modified, and it can be either BT cotton or it can be the glyphosate resistant type, probably everyone in this room is wearing cotton that was genetically modified. Let that sink in. So this is another, uh, I think one of the compelling reasons that labeling is, is so troubling is that there's no bright lines that make sense around what should be labeled and what shouldn't. If you're trying to inform consumers, what are you really getting at with these labels? A great example is the naturally GM sweet potatoes. And this has been making a lot of headlines because this was just discovered about a month ago. 
And the, the reason that this is so significant is, you know, m most crops, as everyone will tell you, have been modified in one way or another over the millennia. You know, they've been crossbred, hybridized. We've been messing with the genetic structure of plants for as long as we've been farming. But the difference in this one is that the agrobacterium transfer DNA is the vehicle that's actually used sometimes when humans purposely modify crops. So this, the, the actual result looks like it would look if this had been genetically modified by man. And that's why this one really blurs the lines about is this genetic modification that should be labeled or isn't it? What's the rationale again? Same thing with sunflowers. There are, and it's not just sunflowers, there's a number of crops that have developed herbicide resistance, not because they were genetically modified to be herbicide resistant, but just because they, for some reason, mutated. And sunflowers are an example. So this is the, the, the money slide, in my opinion, the one that really gets to the heart of the matter. When you stigmatize technology, technology providers are scared away from investing in it. And that's what we're concerned about at the end of the day and why GMA and our companies are so involved in this issue. There are tons of benefits of genetic modification. I've, I've talked about a few in terms of increased yields and no-till farming and all of those things that are pretty common knowledge. And I'm going to get to some of the even better ones. But I think this kind of gets lost in, in the discussion that all of those benefits go away if you demonize the technology to the point that no one wants to invest in it anymore. And we don't want to see that happen. Many of the great benefits that would be lost among them, goodbye orange juice. First found in the US in 2005, citrus greening is a disease spread by psyllids. And it has spread to all 29 counties producing oranges in Florida. Currently, the most effective way to get rid of it is to cut down all of the infected trees. Figures released in April by USDA show that Florida is expected to produce 102 million boxes of oranges this year. That is the lowest number since the state produced 100.5 million boxes in 1968. Just in 2004, Florida produced two and a half times as many with 242 million boxes of oranges. This is actually um, an example of genetic modification where orange trees were, they borrowed a trait from spinach. Spinach is naturally resistant to citrus greening and the trees that they're now planting with this trait are showing that they are resistant naturally to citrus greening and they're surviving even when being exposed to it. But they have a long way to go still through the regulatory process and are not yet commercially available. Another one is golden rice, and this is in the news a lot, and I'm sure you've heard about it before, but in developing countries where white rice is the dominant food, a half a million people become blind, and two million people die every year because of vitamin A deficiency. If you can add vitamin A to their staple food, you can actually save lives. Bananas are the same issue. If your staple food is bananas and not rice, you can put vitamin A in bananas and, and again, save people's lives. The innate potato, I'm sure you've heard of, gets rid of acrylamide. So when it's baked at a high temperature, it has less of that potentially cancer-causing ingredient. And acrylamide is a natural occurring ingredient. So before I wrap up, I, I didn't put a slide in about it, but I want to mention, if you feel as we do that this is an issue that you want to see this technology protected, you can support legislation at the federal level that would actually provide uniformity and protect this technology going forward. GMA and the Coalition for Safe Affordable Food support federal legislation, H.R. 1599, which would mandate FDA review of all new traits. Currently, that's technically voluntary, although every new trait has gone through it. It would establish uniformity in labeling GM ingredients by setting up a certification through USDA and ensure that a non-GMO label means the same thing on every product. Labeling for the absence of GM ingredients provides consumers with the transparency and knowledge that actually means something on the food label. And we support providing a voluntary non-GMO label through federal uniform legislation. <laughs>